Hi guys, uh, welcome back to our PR powerlifting roundtable. Today we have uh, quite a special exclusive topic for you guys. All right, so as you guys know, especially in Singapore and almost the other parts of the country as well, that uh, we are soon be able to train as the gyms will be reopening. And today's topic is what should I do when the gyms reopen again and what kind of training should I adopt? Once again, today I'm Clinton and right here with me, I have JJ and Adam. Uh, we have prepared some slides for you. So um, this time around, if you guys are really interested in this topic, which you guys will be, because if you guys actually click our video based on the topic that we have uh, put it up, uh, you guys should be more or less interested in what you need to do and what we have to say. All right. So the sequence of how... It's going to be like is uh, JJ is going to start presenting first about the training as well as Adam into a more interesting approach to this topic. And lastly, I'm going to talk about the mental approach towards post-COVID-19 lockdown training. Okay, so with that, JJ, take it away. Okay, so with, with my presentation, we're going to talk about just returning to training after a, a break. So, some, so what I'm going to do is going to run through some basically some objectives of the of what we want to achieve with our uh, post uh, lockdown training, as well as um, some expectations, and then I'll I'll show you guys like a sample program, like a one week of what we're maybe like the first week of what we're going to do, and then I'll talk through some uh, ways to progress uh, week week to week. Okay. So the objectives of, for me at least, would be, in my opinion, the most important thing would be to re reacquire some motor competency and a technical understanding, especially under the, the barbell. So think about it this way. It's like, imagine if you, if you start, just learn how to, uh, you just learn how to ride a bike, right? After a while, you're, you need to keep practicing to be able to maintain that skill. Right, but then if you don't write for a long time, you will you will kind of uh, uh once you've learned it and you don't write for a long time, you might not be a, uh, as good as controlling the the bike. But once you come back to it and you start to start to sort of um pick it up again, you won't forget how to ride the bike. So, but the thing is, you just need to sort of brush up on the technique of doing it. Right. So this is the same for the barbell movements as well. You you'll need some time to kind of adapt and move and learn to move under the bar all right so the next the next objective will, we will be looking at rebuilding capacity and volume tolerance so in that sense when you start to when you start to train you might maybe in the past you might be able to do sort of like sixes or eights quite easily and or you you feel that at a certain weight you should be able to do this amount of uh, volume with it all right so when you just come back you also sort of be a bit detrained in terms of your capacity to, to do the work so this is something that we want to sort of uh, bring back up as well. And then the obvious ones would be to obviously reboot uh, your top end strength. So things like moving slightly heavier weight and learning how to sort of uh, manage your own body and your own uh, technique under that kind of things. Right. And the last one, which is also really, really important, would be to sort of like manage the risk of injury. Because if you just come back from, if you just come back from a long break, your body at, Again, it's not used to the, not used to it, and if you just suddenly go uh, go past like what your body's uh, like sort of tissue capacity can handle, that's where you start to um, experience some issues in terms of like uh, in terms of sort of like overuse injuries or things like okay, like um, you know if you contract your your muscles that are not uh, prepared for it, then you might you might get some strains and stuff like that. Okay. So in terms of expectations of what is what the training post uh, lockdown is going to feel like, um, so bio movements may feel foreign and sluggish. So I put a peach emoji there because your training might feel like ass. So just like just uh, be prepared for that. So the first few weeks you might you might be under the bar and you 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 feel like oh, okay, um, I'm I like why is everything so slow? Why is everything so slow? But then when you when you film yourself and you look on camera, it's like it looks okay, leh. And then so so you're like, so you're gonna be like, okay, like how I'm feeling isn't really correlated to what what is what is really happening, right? 
So at that point of time, you need to know, okay, like what, what are the steps do I, do I take to sort of like uh, adjust my programming or even if I, I should ignore the way I feel because how, how I'm feeling at the moment is not necessarily a good representation of what's actually happening, right? So like I said, overall capacity and volume tolerance may be lower. So it would mean that you don't jump into like doing the kind of volume or handling the kind of volume that you've been doing uh, before the lockdown. Right, so a big uh, another big thing is that your max strength will be dampened. So, just be really careful with the with the kind of jumps you take, especially if you do a more RP style or RP based programming. Like your last warm up might feel really good, and then you make a small jump, and then suddenly you're you're overshooting because you had you had that that small jump might be a big percentage of uh, what your what your relative uh, intensity is. And that, and because you you don't have that skill to make those kind of jumps anymore, your your big jumps might cause you to go from an undershoot to an overshoot. Okay, and the last one will be obviously your increased recovery load because um most is if you have been quite sedentary during uh lock the lockdown and stuff, your the sleep, your nutrition, your stress, uh all of these all of these things will need to be uh more uh, dialed in, especially if you're going back into training. As well, because now there's a new input of uh, of the of training, and there's a new amount of stress. Okay, so I'm gonna uh, show you guys a stem, uh, sample program that I've written. So that uh, this is something that you can use and uh, you can use to kind of um to have a look at to, to sort of adapt into your own training and and things that you wanna do. I've given you a few options as well as uh, some uh, recommended ranges that you can um, and you you can play around with. Okay, so one sec, I'm going to stop share, and I'm going to share, where the hell is it, this, okay, so it's going to run, so the way I've, I've approached it will basically be, uh, will basically be like that, so I'll just go through day one, I'll just go through the four days of training really quickly, so I broke it. so day one and two will prim will will likely be your sort of primary school and primary daily days, right? So on this day we'll do something like uh, a last warm up tempo, uh, a last warm up tempo squat, and a last warm up like sort of tempo bench kind of thing, just so that you we can we can potentiate uh, the skill before going into maybe like a top set. So with the top sets, I for the both. For both the squat and the bench, we'll be doing something like a like a top single or top triple, just at a sort of really really low RP, just so that we have a sort of good starting point and gauge for um where we are. And the thing that uh, that you should know about this is um you probably shouldn't be you could probably go a bit higher, but I wouldn't I wouldn't go sort of like to, to the nines and like a high RP. So maybe like a six or a seven would be would be good just so that. You you don't have this sudden influx or a big uh, influx of stress and and of course to prevent yourself from also overshooting right so the first week you want to start conservative so that you actually have space to build into and you can ramp up across the, um, the next few weeks rather than just thinking okay I'm just gonna max out and then keep 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 uh, maxing out every week to see where I'm at right that's not um, that's not how we want to build. And also, if you go too heavy as well, like what I said, we're opening up yourself to a risk of injury, especially if you haven't been touching heavy weights for a long time, right? And then with the back off volume, we'll just do something quite conservative. So it's like a four by three and stuff to add, add uh, a big chunk of a big chunk of uh, a percentage back off because um, you just want to, again, you want to reacquire the skill. <clears throat> and, and it's like, if you, if you go too heavy, Sometimes you're 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 gonna ingrain poorer motor patterns than if you are doing some sort of sub max work to just build some kind of a skill adaptation um, uh, back into the into the program. So with the day one as well, if you look at the accessories, where I do I say I put a quad eye a vertical pull as well as a static core. So what I mean by that is um I would do a isolation quad movement. So <clears throat> something easy just to ease back the volume. And then with the vertical pull, so I'm not sure if um, you most people will have will have the ability the ability to be doing any sort of pulling work at home. So if you have a pull up bar and stuff, that's good. But also I think there are certain people who 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 don't have that. 
So getting some sort of vertical pulling movement back in there would be good as well because um, the lats will help stabilize the sort of the whole the the sort of trunk in the back, <coughs> right? And then the static core, would, which would be something like a a core exercise that is not moving. So you can use anything from like a plank, a weighted plank, uh, side planks, uh, Copenhagen planks. Like um, I haven't really written in because um I think the accessory should be really targeted to your needs. Okay. So the same thing for the for the day two as well. The the idea is the same. Primary deadlift day, um, you can walk up walk up to a top to a top uh, single or triple. So <clears throat> again, giving yourself a good uh, ballpark on where you would like to start, right? So if I would say that if you are a bit more novice, I would I wouldn't go towards the uh, the sing the singles. I will go towards the triples because that will allow you to sort of accumulate more volume and more good reps while keeping the relative intensity low. Okay. And the only difference between the deadlift and the and the and the and the sort of uh, and the squat and the bench is that I mean, rather than doing a tempo deadlift, I would do a pause deadlift instead, just so that because I think that what's important about a deadlift is the ability to sort of ram tension at the bottom and get that good starting position. Um, yes, but if you prefer to do a tempo deadlift as well, just to keep the program uh, more uniform and less complex, you can do the same thing. All right. The same thing for the day two accessories, uh, isolated hamstrings, uh, horizontal pull, and a dynamic core. So the dynamic core will be things like your leg raises, your dead bugs and stuff, where you're learning to control your limbs while maintaining a rigid torso. Okay. And then um, the day three and day four would be sort of, your I would consider your secondary uh, squat and deadlift days. So with that, I would I choose a variation such as a tempo tempo or temp or pause uh, squat as as well as a tempo or pause uh, deadlift right so the the only difference between the <clears throat> so secondary day as well we, you could also change up the back offs in terms of doing uh, tempo and pause or into a sort of just more straight com competition style squat or deadlift right and then that would be for a more higher volumes of set with a with a sort of larger back off so to speak so that you can again you can accumulate volume uh, uh quickly back into the program however the only thing that i would say would be to make sure that you are that <clears throat> um that you are prepared because doing this uh, doing the sort of more high volume approach will mean that you feel that first week you will actually feel a bit more sore going into the next few training just because it's it's a sudden like again a sudden influx of stress All right and then, um, so in that sense, if you, you can also use the tempo and pause squat to sort of keep the, the loading low and keep the secondary day low so that the next week's day one and two, you might be able to push your, your singles or your triples a bit harder. So you're, you're actually using the day three and four to just practice the skill of it. <clears throat> okay. So the same thing, I will keep the frequency of the bench the same. So most of my guys bench about three to four times a week. So that would be sort of the structure of day three and day four as well. So the day three and day four will, will, uh, the day three will kind of be more of a moderate day bench, bench press. Uh, so similar to the, so in terms of structure is similar to day one, but uh, it's also RP approach. <clears throat> so for some people, they might find that their day three is a bit more, uh, more sort of, uh, I would call it flattened because they have the the fatigue from day one and two. But at the same time, it's also possible that your day three is actually your strongest day because um, you, if you've taken a break between, say maybe day one and two, and then your day three, your you've 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 gotten the sort of adaptations for day one and two, and your day three feels the strongest. So don't be so don't be don't feel that it's weird if your day three is the strongest. Okay, because um, yeah, and then for the. The day four bench as well would be a just more sort of straight volume uh, just to get you a bit, uh, again, very, very submax kind of uh, work just to get the skin back, right? And then the only difference between the accessories between three and four and one and two is just that for the for day three and four, the quad and the hamstring movements are more compound, compound based. So maybe like a, instead of doing like a leg extension or a Bulgarian or a leg extension or a, you'll be doing like a leg press and then it's, uh, you'll be doing things like 
maybe like a Bulgarian split squat or like a uh, front foot elevated split squats and stuff like that. Just to, just to get a bit more variety of training back in and also I will consider it a more sort of a f- more compound sort of co- uh, leg exercise. Right? So things like a goblet squat and stuff like that can help as well. And then for the hamstrings, you'll be doing things like you'll be doing things like maybe straight leg deadlifts or Romanian deadlifts and stuff like that as well. Just because um, the, the secondary days, the loading might be less, so you might be able to do more work. Right, so you can you can bring up your capacity to tolerate workloads a bit quicker that way. Okay, so that's my suggested um my suggested training program. And yeah, if you guys have any questions or if the Clinton and Adam you guys have any uh, ideas as well or, or critiques, you can also um discuss it. But yeah, that is my presentation. Right. Um, so I feel that um, you guys, uh, the guys watching right now, get to, especially for this video, get to understand and have basically like a training program template for week one uh, presented by JJ. It is a, quite a good start, but uh, it's best to also learn to understand the program and be able to predict and project the subsequent weeks. So if you need help in that, you can definitely come and PM us uh, and we will try to help as much as possible. But right now, um, thanks JJ for the presentation about the training. Now, let's see what Adam has to say. Alrighty, so I'll kick this off. Okay guys, so I've done something a little bit different. Um, I, I, As you can see on, on Instagram or on social media that uh, a lot of coaches have given a lot of good information about uh, returning the training and how you should approach that. So I decided to do something a little bit different. So my coaching style is uh, emergent strategies, which is adopted by uh, reactive training systems. Um, so I've been using this method now for just over two years. Um, and I've used this method method to reintroduce my lifters back in the training. Um, so uh, the, the way I've used it is not, is the, the, way, the, the, the actual process that I have come up with to bring it, to, to reintroduce, reintroduce my lifters back in the training and I've found some success with it. So, but first of all, for those that don't know emergent strategies, I'm just going to briefly go over what emergent strategies is and then I'm going to briefly go over what the stress index is. I'm not going to go into full into detail about it. Um, if you really want to know more about it, then I suggest you go check out the RTS classrooms on emergent strategies and learn it all for yourself. Okay, so as I said, uh, emergent, emergent strategies is a training method invented by Mike Tashira, who is from uh, Reactive Training Systems, that's his company. Um, it's heavily RPE based, but it does use a bit of both RPE and percentage. Um, it's a bottom-up approach compared to a top-down approach. So what is a top-down approach? So the best example I can give you for a top, traditional top-down approach is a, a basic linear progression program, right? So for example, uh, a, a 12-week program and you will find out the date where the lifter needs to compete. Then you start from that date, from whatever weights they need to hit from that date. And then you're going to work back by manipulating volume and intensities all the way back until the start of the program where it'll be low intensities, highish volumes. And then you, you'll gradually build them up to that uh, uh, peak at the end of the program. So, the thing about that kind of programming is that it heavily relies on assumptions. So you're assuming the lifter is going to finish here rather than uh, working with the athlete response week to week basis and then choosing the numbers and, and, and strategizing what they need to hit until the comp. Um, so the, the thing about, the beauty about bottom-up approach is that when you 
start with a lifter, say that the lifters had some experience with RPE and they know what they're doing. And then you, you are, or even if you, after you've trained them how to read the RPE better and you've been coaching with them for a while and you, they understand how you program and you understand how they react to the, uh, the training style, then uh, we jump straight onto a development block where it's a repeated microcycle. So the microcycle is a training week. So you repeat that same week with a certain amount of stimulus, which is stress. Um, and then you keep repeating that week until it no longer works anymore. Okay. So you take it a little bit too far. And then while you're doing that, you are tracking the lifters uh, estimated one RM and you're also tracking the athlete's fatigue, um, how they're responding to the, to the, the stimulus and they're not getting too beat up and then you see where that 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 peak in the estimated one around and you and it tells you which exposure the lifter responds best to to a certain stimulus of the stress index um, with some lifters they peak and they drop off and they pick back up that's why you take a little bit too far to see if that you get that kind of response or if you see their peak and they just completely drop straight off but you really need to communicate well with the lifter if they're getting way too uh, beat up, then you just cut it. And then you start a pivot block, which I'll go through in a minute. So that's, that's a kind of like a bottom up approach. So through that process of learning uh, what the lifter really responds best to and how many exposures it takes for them to get to a certain point, then with that data, you know how you can work back from there to structure your programs and, and, and make it all fit into a, 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 you know, a, a plan that will get you wherever you need to be for whatever competition. But it also gives you that flexibility to be able to, to change things up, to work around uh, life and other sort of things. And I don't want to go into too much detail about that because we'll just be here for a while. But there's, there's many other strategies to make it actually work and be able to, to, to react to the situation rather than trying to hold on to that plan and trying to make that plan work and push that athlete too far. So as I said, it heavily relies on athlete response and data um, and, and, and it determines how many exposures it takes for the lift at the peak. It's typically a week, but sometimes you can manipulate it to be able to have two microcycles in a week, so it'll get them to peak a little bit quicker, but that's depending on the athlete if they can take the work or not. And that, um, that comes up with a bit of skill of programming as well. Okay, so stress index. So the stress index is used to uh, determine the microcycle for the lifter, okay? Relatively, if, if the new lifter comes on, you start with a kind of lowish stress index, and then you see how that lifter uh, reacts and then you can slowly introduce more stress to see how the, the lifter reacts, uh, if they react differently or if they get better or if their work capacity gets better or um, have times in a training year or training block where you can explore different stresses, but you don't wanna, you don't wanna go from a, you know, like a 15, for example, 15, just a random number to uh, 20 because that's just too much of a difference. So, uh, so a stress index is a coefficient to calculate the stress for, say, uh, upper body for bench press push, and then the lower body, you know, your knee dominant and your hip dominant exercises, and then you're gonna, and that, that'll give you a better idea how to structure your program um, moving forward uh, with different type of st uh, stimuluses, uh, different intensity sets, reps, exercises, but matching that stress index. Okay, if that makes sense. Um, it uses fatigue, uh, muscle fatigue and CNS fatigue to calculate the total stress of the athlete that is subjected to. Okay, um, also another thing, uh, you, you hear a lot of uh, guys, how they program it. They'll program with a lot of using volume as how they would program and um, uh, my argument against that is that um, volume is not that sufficient to determine 
a, a recovery demand, right? For example, if you if I had if you had a lifter do two sets of ten at seventy five percent, that would be a high RP. That would be around a nine to ten RP, right? But in, but instead, you've got them do ten sets of two at the same weight. You have the exact same volume, but you'll have a different outcome at the end of the session. You might get pretty bored doing 10 sets of twos at 75% because that's pretty light. Um, or you can even do four sets of five at 75%. You still have the exact same volume, but you'll have a different stress effect. Okay? So that's my argument about that. And, and then stress index takes that into consideration. So uh, that's all I'm going to go on about stress index. Next, I've got a case study. Uh, one of my lifters, Josh Chiller, he, he ran a lockdown in Perth. Uh, before his lockdown, we were training for a competition that was leading up that, uh, that, that got cancelled uh, because of obvious reasons. Um, so for that block, I was using the best stress that he reacts to. Um, he was responding really well. Um, and then all of a sudden, lockdown happened and... He's, he was literally doing home workouts for nearly two months. Then all of a sudden, he's, he's got access to a gym. So what I did with Josh is since he was working hard all the way through that, uh, that lockdown, he was, he, was, he was still kind of doing a lot of, a lot of reps. I don't know about volume because he's doing a lot of body weight stuff as well. He had access to an axle bar, but he was only so limited to weights and he was adding bands and all that sort of stuff. But he did train consistently through then. Um, so when he came back to training, I put him on a, a little bit less stress of a pivot block. So what in a pivot block, what it is is we do alternative movements opposites to the competition movement. And we, we do a little bit of volume with that and then we'll do some tempo work through that uh, just to get some work capacity back uh, with the tempo work, work on a little bit of that uh, tendon elasticity um, and also adding in a lot of variations. So it spreads the stress all the way through the body rather than a, a isolated region. So we'll be doing a lot of um, anti-rotational ab work, a lot of rotational ab work, a lot of static, a lot of unilateral work, a lot of, uh, vertical pulling, horizontal pulling, all that sort of stuff, the top stuff we don't get time for when we do a, um, a development block. So we did that, uh, heavily communicated with him. He said, I, I feel good, I don't feel beat up. Um, so I, I, I introduced him into a intro block. And with this intro block, it was 50% of the, the stress that he's used to. So. Uh, the way I structured that, instead of trying to make the uh, the sessions shorter, I just took a session out a week and gave them three sessions. But there's many other ways you could you could approach it. But that's the way I did it. So I give I gave him a lot of um, a very low intensity volume, but I gave him a top set to gauge uh, his his session. So that top set gauges the stress. Uh, the, the intensity the session is intended for and then uh, back off percentage work after that, which is very low sub maximal stuff, but still kind of calculated with a stress index. So I ran him on that. He responded quite well. He said, uh, yeah, I'm good to go. I don't feel beat up. So I started on a development block, but instead of starting him on a development block on the stress that he's, used to, like just before he went on lockdown, I started on a development block that is around 20 to 25% uh, with a bit of room, um, more than his intro block. So, so 20, 20, 25%, so 70, 75% of what he's used to. We got him onto that and we had some really interesting results. He's, he's on, just finished week five now. And, uh, and I'll go through and I'll show you his uh, estimated uh, RMs and his estimated totals uh, we've been tracking. So all this stuff beforehand is what he's done with, before me. Um, 
before he started with me, he's, he's used RP before he's done a very similar programming. So he's, he, he knew, knows how to attack the training and, um, and he really adapted quite well. So you'll see these dips and they're usually the start of a training block. You're obviously not going to start your training block at the best you finish your last training block. There's going to be some strength decay there after a pivot block because when we finish a development block, we do a two-week or depending on the size of the development block, we do a, a, um, a pivot block. But this here in the square is when he started back training. Okay, so it's very interesting where he started his strength. This is, this is calculated off his top set. And this is the intro week here. I use intro week to gauge where he needs to be for his day, uh, week one for his development block. And he's gone up to week five now. It, his blocks are usually six weeks because he, he's six exposures. And um, man, he's in PR, to, like, He's way beyond PR for his estimated total. And it's really crazy because he's had two months off training. So maybe, you know, it's not all, you know, all bad from having that time off. You might even come back. You're not, not straight away. You'll come back strong. But at the end of it, you might be the strongest you've ever been, like Josh. So this is... Uh, this is, I was going through the estimated total because the total is what matters most. And then we'll go through his, each lift and you'll see this dip here and you'll be thinking, what's going on here? You know, you got the stress wrong or whatever. But uh, Josh is a donkey who misloaded his uh, barbell by 10 kilos. He still executed lift, but it was at a very high RP. But um, still, a P, still a PR for a squat. Um, but then it, you know, obviously dipped off because maybe a little bit of fatigue or maybe it just reduced the load a little bit to just be a bit more cautious compared to this week here. Um, if you look at the bench, bench looks like it's took, taken a bit of a tank. Um, could be strength, could be a combination of strength or it could be technique, could be the equipment he was on when he started the development block because he was, he was training out of a garage. Um, and now he's just gone back to a, a competition equipment this week. Um, could be a combination or whatever, but it's still tracking in the right direction, which we like to see. And then his deadlift is just flown up. So I think, I think that's really a really cool experiment and looking back at his data. The reason why I used Josh as a case study is because he's one of the first ones to go back to training after lockdown. I've got, a number of lifters that have gone back to training, but there's not enough data to show to, to really use as a case study. It's just only done a couple of weeks of training. Um, so yeah, that's, that's with Josh. Um, and so some programming considerations that I made, um, these are not set in stone. These are the ones I made for me. Um, so uh, oh, with emerge strategies, you always start with a pivot anyway. But I started with a pivot, and then I, I monitored, I monitor my lifters to see how they are after that pivot. If they seem a little bit rusty, beat up, I will give them another week of pivot. Um, I, I tend to be a little bit harsh as well. If they, you know, they don't seem like they're responding quite well to the pivot, I'll give them another week, and they'll be like, "Coach, I don't want to do another pivot." And I'm like, "Too bad. It's it's." Um, more important now to to really take your time to get the groove back than rather rush into things um it's 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 really important um because it's going to take you some time to really adapt and some people might adapt a bit quicker than others and some might be you know a bit slow but it has to be heavily relied on athlete response um, so, and then go into intro block are roughly around, you know, 50% of what they're used to see how they react. If they need more, give them more. And then go into a block with a lower a development block to the kind of length that they're, they're used to with a lower stress, just to get it all moving and get them back into a groove again. And then, and then look into the next block at adding a little bit more stress and then see how they respond and then just slowly build back up to their uh, work capacity. 
Um, what I really like to use is use the uh, RPE and the estimated YRAM to determine the working sets given for an exercise. So there's, a, there's two ways that I've given here uh, that are examples. Um, uh, for my lifters as well, I didn't push them any uh, further than an 8 RP. Some, some programs you'll see that I'll program with them is a 9 RP set, um, but none of them will get a 9 RP, especially in the first couple of blocks. Um, so, and you'll see the reps are a little bit higher for a top set as well, because that'll just lower the intensity. So for here, you know, a four to eight, and then it'll work out the estimated one RM and then your percentage work is worked off from that estimated one RM. So you can get some low intensity, sub-maximal volume through here. Um, also you can do a ramping style set. Uh, you can work up to a top set. So instead of having your top set first, you can have it uh, second last here and then you can repeat the top set down here and, um, and use that as data. Use the, um, oops. use the top set as the data and, you, and, and then track their progress all the way through. If you start to see, you know, if I start to see a big dip, then uh, we call it off, start a pivot and then we restart again, wash it out, go again. Um, uh, some considerations with uh, secondary de developmental exercises. Uh, rather, rather than working on weight range of motion, you really want to work on refining that technique because your weakness right now will be your technique, not your range of motion. So you want to really refine that movement pattern, really work um, to build that uh, movement pattern back. And uh, a few good ways to... to a uh, few good methods to use is tempo work. And, and you, you see that JJ was really implementing a lot of tempo work for his, his style of program. So, uh, you know, for example, for what I'd like to use is a three, two, zero tempo, you know, it's a, a slower eccentric than a, a, a exaggerated pause at the bottom, or you can do a three Oh three tempo where it's, you're, you're lowering for three seconds, then you're, um, and then you're coming up in the concentric for three seconds and then that, that'll just give you more uh, technical awareness and where you need to be with that. Okay, um, that's it for that. Okay, other considerations. So what happens if, if uh, I get a new lifter after lockdown and they want to try uh, emergent strategies? So what I would do with them, I'd look back at previous data that they have, uh, programming if they have that, and then I'll make it a... It, educational uh, decision of where they need to start and what they need to do. So typically I will start them on half the stress of what I come up with there or a little bit more just to be on the side of caution. And then just if they're not used to working with RPE during that time, it'd be a really good time. And I really wish, you know, I had that time when I started working with RPE, but I had competitions coming up is to really, uh, develop that skill of rating RPE. And, and I think it, it, after that time, after lockdown and coming on and trying emerging strategies, it would be a good time to really work on that skill, work on the, the, the coaching and athlete relationship and see how both of us work together and then really uh, build out some solid information uh, from there moving forward over the next month or so. Um, and then really refining any technical uh, skills, um, any technical decay or anything like that, just to really get the ball rolling. Uh, so what happens if the lifter is brand new? Well, I, I no longer work in a gym anymore, so I don't take on any clients. And I always recommend brand new lifters to go get coaching in person. So if you're looking, if you're in Singapore, you're looking for coaching in person, go to... Uh, Elevate, I highly recommend Elevate. Not only if you, if you can't get your hands uh, on Clinton, they have plenty of other coaches there that are fantastic and go check them out. And there's no better place to train powerlifting out of a powerlifting Pacific gym. So highly re recommend you go check them out. But if you're in Australia and you're looking for a, a coach there, then feel free to DM me and tell me which location and I'll help find you a coach. And if I don't know a coach, I can ask a few people to find someone for you. I think it's very important that you find a good 
powerlifting coach that understands powerlifting that's been doing it for a while. Don't get someone that's just been in the sport for two minutes and they think they know everything. Get someone that's been around for a while. Um, and then my last example, uh, what happens if a lifter has a meet coming up straight out of lockdown? For example, nine weeks post lockdown, they got six exposures. Firstly, I'll have a conversation with the lifter and say, hmm, how important is this meet to you? Is it a local meet? Is it an international meet? Do you really want to do this meet? If it's very low importance, I'll say, hey, just, you know, uh, how about we would look at competing towards the end of the year or something and we can build back that work capacity and that, those qualities. But if it's an important meet, um, then I would have to really work on the athlete response at the start. Uh, the blocks, yeah, they respond and then, and then there's so many ways you can manipulate the training training blocks. You can you can do an intro block, then a maintenance, then go straight into a development with a lower stress, um, and then just make a, a, a good decision by their progress and see how they they peak and and um, use previous data to to make uh, the the decision if they need a taper or they'll go all the way through like an emergency strategy style. So um, if you guys want to add any other considerations, let me know at the end um, and I'll, I'll try my best to answer those. Uh, so it, where, if you want to learn more about emerge strategies as a coach, I highly recommend you go check out RTS Classrooms. Um, they have shaped me to a coach I am today um, and, and I, I heavily use their principles in my coaching um, and yeah, go check them out. And if you're uh, interested in emergent strategies type programming um, and you don't want to spend big bucks with RTS, you can come and see me and I'm, t I'm currently taking on clients too. So that's all I got. <laughs> and um, yeah, looking forward to hearing what Clinton has to say. Uh, yeah, if you've got any questions, please DM me. And uh, sorry, this took a bit longer than it should have, but yeah. Um, I'm very passionate about programming. All right, cheers. All right, very long but very, very informative information from Adams. Uh, so if you are someone who really want to go down to whatever details about training and programming, Adam is the way to go and whichever information that he has provided to you are very useful and can be introduced into your training program in the future days to come. For example, if you guys are not exposed to learning uh, RPE training and feeling the right RPE as well as understanding the stress index, the post-COVID-19 lockdown uh, reopening of the gym training will be a good time for you to uh, learn the aspect of training, especially in powerlifting which is quite important for you because without understanding the stress level and index and as well as uh, rating the right RPE, it is very hard to express yourself to either the coach or whichever data uh, analysis you want to put in as a presentation. All right. Okay. So... Uh, right now, I'm just going to share my slides and my slides is a little bit more uh, more towards the aspect in terms of your mentality and your mental approach to this kind of tra uh, your training in future. Right. Okay, so a training program or a training block which uh, JJ and Adam has mentioned about cannot be successful and fulfilling without the right mental approach. So today, what I'm going to do instead of sharing with you my point of view of what kind of training you should do, which is basically almost the same as Adam and JJ because everybody will more or less think the same way. But um, today, I'm going to drive you into the right direction in terms of your mental approach so as to create that good and safe and perfect more or less perfect environment and scenario for you to start back your training and start in a positive note. Okay, so let's talk about, in, in order for us to be very relatable in this situation and what I'm talking about, let's try and visualize the current mood and mentality 
three days before you are going to a gym when the gym reopens again. So what basically I would feel, because I'm a human being as well, is that I will be eager to hit the gym and I will be eager to smash the weights again because it's been a while since I squat bench they lift and I really want to feel the weight on my back and uh, feel the weight crumbling me down and feel good about it and I got no uh, God knows why we enjoy powerlifting, right? But nevertheless, this is what we really like to do. We want to hit some heavy weights. And what we really want to know is actually how much strength I have lost and what is my strength level, right? And what I really want to do is, obviously, I want to get back to the previous strength level that I have paused for a while before the gyms are forced to close, okay? And this is what I wish for. I wish that um. I did not lose that much strength. All the home training that I've done, um, I, I hope that they will be able to maintain my strength level and more or less to, did not, uh, will not drop my strength so much. So this is what I always hope for, right? And I believe you guys feel the same as well, okay? And I will start to obviously project myself, okay, I will think about, okay, I will, I'm going to lose strength. So how many percent of it? So. Um, if I try to be very, very optimistic, I will hope that, okay, my strength level will only drop the maximum about 10 to 15%, which is quite, uh, which is not much. So this is what I hope and this is what I project as well. So when I start my training and plan about my training, I will think about, okay, imagine I only lose 10% of my strength. This is my current one at max and I want to plan my training around it. Okay, so... This is what I will feel definitely. I will be very excited to try and gain back the strength as soon as possible, okay? So I want to set a very compact and fast time uh, program so that I can drive my strength level back to normal. So I'm kind of thinking of how do I get my strength back as fast as possible and try and rush the process. So whatever scenario and whatever... Um, uh, thoughts that you that have described uh, just now is basically a lot of false hope, a lot of inaccurate assumption, and obviously an overly high expectations. Okay, so I may be exaggerating here, but this is basically how I would feel as an athlete if I will be able to train again. This is definitely how I want to think uh, about in terms of my strength level. I do not want it to lose so much, and uh, you know. If there is a miracle, I hope that you know I can come back to the gym, hit one rem max, and then I can break a PR or something like that. Okay, this I I I'm pretty sure that most of you will visualize it that way. But here's what you need to do, and I guess the right approach to the training and post COVID nineteen lockdown when you start hitting the gyms again is we have mentioned this before, and it is to live in the present and be realistic. Okay. So whatever, whatever uh, things that I mentioned just now is trying to predict what the future is. And we always like to plan and predict the perfect scenario. It's like someone who is planning, okay, in five years time, I'm going to drive a McLaren or something like that. But you know, whether or not it's realistic or not, it's very hard to say. Okay. But what I'm trying to ask you to do is to try and to be realistic in what you uh, what you are now, especially, you need to learn to manage your expectations, okay? Basically, understanding that when you come back to training, that many things has changed, okay? You're not looking to unpause um, uh, and continue on from where you have left off from training. What you're looking for is the big restart of training. So take it as, okay, uh, I went. I, I I went for a long holiday, three months holiday or three months honeymoon. Obviously, if I'm rich enough, three months honeymoon with my uh, wife, and I come back to training and I want to hit a big restart instead of okay, I'm gonna continue where you left off. You're obviously not gonna achieve anything from there. So think of this training as a big restart, as a restart button for you to start your journey again. Okay, so when you're start when you're trying to start a new journey. Uh, what you can do especially is to change your perspective in your training. So think about all the flaws that have happened when, uh, when you were training before COVID-19. Like what are the bad habits you like to adopt? For example, 
I like to dive into my squats. Uh, I like to be very, very, I, I tend to be too aggressive when I bench. That's why I lose the composure and stability of the bench. And for deadlift, maybe I like to jerk the bar a lot because that feels good. That f- makes me feel like a man. So look at, find out all these problems and flaws that you have. You tend to like to do, but you know that it is not appropriate and change it in your big restart, in your big return to your uh, training in the gym. So in terms of training to be more objective, we are looking at, okay, I want to be more technical. I want to improve my technique. I understand that when I was squatting previously, I did not uh, have the ability to maintain a rigid torso when I squat. So I like to hyperextend and create a chest up maneuver. So uh, after watching the videos of Technique Matters about proper bracing for squats, now I'm going to try and um, achieve the right torso angle and bracing for the squats. So something like that to be more objective. Because if you change your perspective of training in that manner, your, your projection and your journey will be much more interesting for you instead of, okay, I just want to hit the angle. I just want to go for maximum strength. I want to hit P. I want to be top of the world. You know what I mean? Okay, last but not least, what, I'm want, what I want to tell you is you have to understand the nature of things and what needs to be done. So Adam and JJ has mentioned and discussed with you the nature of how you would feel when you come back to training, which is why sometimes we should definitely forget about percentages and your actual previous Warren Max. As you can see, the pattern here from Adam and JJ's training is we look into the RPE training and stress level a lot. Okay, That is one as well as learning, relearning the technique of it. Because the nature of what's going to happen when you come back to training is you're just going to forget how it feels like to, be a bar, to have a bar behind your back, to be able to squat like you used to be. All right? So by understanding this fact, you will tend to have a different approach to your training after when you get back to the gym again you will tell yourself that okay um, like driving it's been a while since I drive I do not want to bang and knock somebody over I'm going to be extra careful with it yes this is what definitely what you should do okay so if you get the right gist of it um, then whatever presentation that I've given to you makes sense all right but um this is what I will try to tell my athletes who are coming back to training that, you know, don't expect a lot. Even though, even though you know, if I tell you that don't expect a lot, you will feel really depressed and then I will kind of screw you up over the, uh, because you, you were initially excited for training, but now you, after understanding, oh shit, this is how I'm going to be, you will feel like, you know, crap and something like that. But if you put yourself in a realistic and present uh, position, you will understand that this is a process for you to go through. And after that, everybody, if under the right coach and under the right knowledge and training and the process of it, you will definitely come out very successful as a powerlifter and then you will definitely start gaining strength. Okay. So, yep. Mine is short and sweet. So, um. Right, so obviously I hope that you know this information these information are quite useful for you guys. Anything for us to share about and cross reference here, JJ and Adam? Uh, I think we we went all unique uh, perspectives again, which is cool. Um, we all have sim- similar mindset and expectations, um, very refining that technique back as well, which is very important. Uh, I think that's that's great that you touched on the mental aspect as well, because you'd be, um, you, you would need to change your perspective coming back into the gym and, and you re- realign your goals temporarily to, to regain better movement and then being able to have that positive mindset and, and, you know, mini milestones will get you uh, along further and happier and you feel a lot better about it. Because strength uh, decay is inevitable. Um, in my case study, he seems like he, he held on to a bit of strength or he got his strength quite quickly back. So it's not all doom, or, doom and gloom. So, and he came back even stronger. So I'm not saying that's going to happen to everyone, but it's, it's possible. 
and 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 what he did as well is we'll just heavily emphasize on technical execution and hitting the rps and then hitting the, the correct stress and then taking our time to to really get back into full training um anything else please all right so yep so guys take this big restart or um, as a opportunity for you guys to remain all the mistakes that you guys tend to like to do and make this a very good journey and good start of the journey for you for your training once again okay so if if we are done here and i hope that you guys uh, enjoy what we have shared to you and till then we'll see you again goodbye